Broadcast One, Red Hook speaking. Welcome, podcast listeners, to another edition of my sailing podcast. Thanks so much for listening in. And before we get things underway this month, a big, big thank you for all your comments on last month's pod. There's been a lot of love for Jimmy Spiddle. So if you got in touch, liked, commented or subscribed, as ever, thank you. It's much appreciated. Any interaction, it really means a lot. So what have we got for you this month? This edition of the podcast is a little different. It's another bumper two-part pod. And with all the action holding up in the America's Cup, we thought we'd push the boat out and try and talk to all four of the design teams from each of the Cup's teams around the world. We've all seen the footage online of the new AC-75 monohull zipping around on their foils. They look magnificent. So this month, we're lifting the bonnet on the new Cup class, getting the design lowdown from each camp. In the interest of transparency, we didn't travel to every design office. I spoke to the two European teams in person, travelling to Sardinia, to chat to Luna Rossa, and just across the Solent here to talk to Team Ineos UK. But we had much appreciated help. We sent questions to the Defender, to Emirates Team New Zealand's design team in Auckland, and had local assistants recording a telephone interview with the American designers based in Santander, Spain. So before we get underway, a big, big thank you to everyone involved in making this happen. To the four design chiefs themselves for their valuable time at such a crucial moment in the whole cup process. A huge thank you. It's a fascinating listen. We really get an understanding of how this new cup class is shaping up, the design rules, the hurdles and challenges, it's really enlightening. I hope you all enjoy the time I spent with the design teams of AC36. We went ahead with this concept having only ever tried it on a simulator. The stakes are pretty high because some people get it right and some people get it wrong. From those simulations, we were, I must say, right from the beginning, very confident that it would work. We kick things off, of course, with the Defenders and Emirates Team New Zealand's design chief, Dan Berners-Sconi. Dan was a key figure last time around, leading the team that built the AC-50 that foiled New Zealand to victory in the great sound of Bermuda. I started by asking Dan how things were shaping up with the team in Auckland. We're really excited about the event coming up in Cagliari and the one in Portsmouth following that. Uh, we've watched with a lot of interest what other teams have launched with and uh, I think it will be pretty exciting for everyone to see how the boats go against each other. Um, we're, we're feeling good, we've had a lot of time on the water, um, but on the other hand our boat goes on a ship pretty soon uh, and whilst we're um, sitting on a ship, then all the other teams will be in calorie training and improving. So we've had to make a, get a bit of a head start um, and we'll see how we go when we get there. But yeah, really looking forward to it. Let's just start the podcast, Dan, with a quick recap. And as defenders, you specifically were instrumental in laying out the design criteria of the boats for AC36. Can you give us a quick summary of what the teams need to be building? Give us a quick summary of the AC-75. Sure. So the AC-75, it's a 75-foot long monohull. Uh, the whole length is 68 feet and then a 7-foot bowsprit. Um, there's two foils which are supported on either side of the boat by composite foil arms, but the foils themselves, uh, uh, they're ballasted to provide some stability and to increase the overall weight and riding moment of the boat. And the two foils can be raised up and down independently depending on what tack you're on. Uh, then driving the boat is a rig, which is a, a new type of rig for America's Cup, which is a D-section spar with two 
a double, well, a double skin mainsail coming off the back of the D section to provide a sort of solid cross section with a hoistable sail, which sort of combines the efficiency of a solid wing with the sort of convenience of being able to, to leave a, a mast in the boat um, when at the dock or at a mooring. And um, single rudder, uh, a range of headsails, including a Code Zero flying off the bowsprit. The teams are pretty much building building all of their boat. The the only uh, supplied components are the foil arms. They're the same for all teams and being built by Persico in Italy. And the reason we made those supplied components is that they're pretty uh, complex structural components um, and we didn't think that it would add a lot to the competition for each team to be developing those independently. They're, they're complex to build, but in the end, uh, they're mostly out of the water, so not really uh, providing that much differentiation between one team and another. So we, we made those one design components and supplied components so that teams can basically concentrate on the areas that are a lot more interesting for R&D and development, which is the hull shape, the foils and rudder, and the rig and sails. We've never seen a boat of this kind designed to this degree before. Having come up with the concept, how pleased are you personally to see all four teams out sailing this concept, foiling, reaching good speeds from your original design? Well, it's a hell of a relief to see teams um, successfully getting a boat on the water and um, seeing that the boat works around a, a racetrack. Um, only seen one boat at a time so far, but really looking forward to seeing how, how the match racing goes. So yeah, uh, we, we went ahead with this concept having only ever um, tried it on a simulator, um, but I think it's, it's been validated in real life that it's a really exciting boat to sail, the, the sailors love it, uh, really good performance, and I think it's going to be exciting for spectators as well. We'll hear plenty more from Dan a little later. But before we do, we're going to catch up with the official challenger of record, Italian team Luna Rossa, specifically their design coordinator, Martin Fisher. Martin has a strong pedigree in foiling yacht design, with a raft of design credits to his name. So we took off down to the team's base in Sardinia to find out how things were shaping up. Well, Martin, thanks for joining us. It's not long to go until the first of the World Series events here in Sardinia, of course. And there's a real sense in the cup, isn't there, of the, the ticking clock that, you know, actually time is moving very quickly. How are things going at, at Luna Rossa? Well, um, yeah, time is definitely, as you said, ticking and uh, it's uh, probably the biggest asset in any cup campaign. So time is always running uh, out and uh, as of Luna Rosa well we think we're on track of course I guess as all the other teams we also have our difficulties or have had our difficulties but um, so far we feel that we are on track and there's still a lot of work to be done before Cagliari but we think we'll be ready uh, for racing in April. Explain to us Martin you know the concept a 75 foot foiling monohull like nothing we've seen before in the cup. With Luna Rossa as the challengers of record, how close was your design team involved in the development of the class? Uh, we were very closely involved in the development of the class rules and in the, not really, in, well, partly in the development of the concept as well, but uh, the first step was to, to decide together with Team New Zealand what kind of boat it will be and then uh, writing the class rules together with Team New Zealand. And uh, that was a long process. It took about six months, more or less, yeah, six months, to come out with the first version of the class rules. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of work and we were very closely involved. I mean, it looks from the outside that it's, you know, when we saw those initial drawings that it was really far away the design I mean how how much did it feel like that at the time that this was pretty ambitious we were confident that it would work that the concept would work um, before uh, our first meeting with team uh, New Zealand they had already worked on the concept and um, first calculations had been done 
and uh, then they they showed us also the a version of the boat in, in their simulator so we we could uh, discuss it with them see how it works and um, and test it and uh, from those simulations we were i must say right from the beginning very confident that it would work um, so i at least I, yeah i think i can speak for for us and for sure also for for team new zealand who worked on that that uh, we we were not too afraid that uh, it would not work so two of the teams, the Defender Emirates Team New Zealand and the challenger of record Luna Rossa, have been working together to create the blueprint, if you like, the rules that surround the design and build of the new AC75 class. Working to those rules then are the other two teams that have declared an interest as challengers. The first of whom we talked to being the British Cup interest Ineos Team UK. Heading up the INEOS design team is New Zealander Nick Holroyd, another cup veteran, previously with Emirates Team New Zealand and then in the last cup with Dean Barker's Japanese challenger. We spoke to Nick at the team base in Portsmouth. Hi Nick, well last time I interviewed you, you were with Team Japan in Bermuda of course, this time with INEOS in the UK. How are things progressing here at Team INEOS UK? Um, progressing, I mean we're, we're almost halfway through the campaign, um, like any America's Cup you feel like you're running out of time already. Um, it's, uh, it's a fairly young team, we've had to build tools, we've had you know, sort of set up time and to be fair we've now got the boat on the water, we're starting to collect da useful data, the boat's getting thrown around a little bit more actively. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're, in, we're in, the, in the thick of it. It's a, a very different boat this time around, the AC75. As a designer with a long history in the America's Cup, how do you approach building a, a brand new class of boat? Oh, I mean, the, the, new, the new class rule is, um, for me anyway, that those are the fun, fun cups. Um, you know, the, the stakes are pretty high because I think some people get it right and some people get it wrong. Um, but at the same time, it's a little bit the wild west of, of yacht design. Um, you know, obviously going back to the, the first foiling cats in San Francisco, new class rule, um, you know, probably didn't anticipate foiling in the first place. You know, it'll be interesting to see what the developments are that probably weren't anticipated by the rule this time around. Yeah, it, it, there's a lot of ground to cover, I think, is, is the big thing about a new class boat. We saw with New Zealand's approach to the last cup, didn't we, how a bold approach can pay serious dividends. How much of what you learned from the last cup is applicable now? Um, I think everything you've learned from every cup is applicable right now. Um, yeah, I mean, you try, you try to bring that with you. Um, yeah, I think uh, in, a, in a new class of boat, balancing uh, kind of risk assessment versus you know, how, how far out you want to push uh, push things, you know, the creative side. Um, those, those are things that come with experience at some level. Um, so you, 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 you're desperately trying to apply those to the best of your ability right now. The fourth cup team on the roster is of course American Magic, the newest team to the world of the America's Cup. Their head of design brings years of high-end yacht design experience to the table. Another previous Emirates Team New Zealand design team member, Marcelina Botin Studio are one of the go-to design teams for high-end yacht design. They've built Volvo Ocean Race yachts and have an established working relationship with the Americans through the design of the championship winning TP52 Quantum Racing. Hi Marcelina, many thanks for your time doing this. Tell us, how are things going at American Magic? Well, it's, it's going well. We're um, we're sailing in in Pensacola right, at this time, training and um, looking forward to, to to do some racing in in Cagliari in, in in the next the next month. We see in the AC seventy five Marcelino a, a new class of cut boats. Personally, how exciting for you is it to be designing such a, a radical new design of race boats? Well, it's it's a very very interesting boats to design for sure. It's uh, they're extremely fun 
as, as a design project. And um, because obviously it's a new concept, it's a, it's a very complex bird in all areas. And, uh, and for a design, for a designer, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting project. As a, as a race boat, I'm not so sure whether it's, uh, it'll be as good as, uh, as some other uh, classes which, which we had in the past, but we'll, we'll, we'll find out soon enough. You know, it's, it's something to be, to be discovered in the next few months, I guess. How extreme is this design project? I mean, a fully foiling monohull. How how radical is that to design and to build? Well, it's it's pretty radical. I mean, it's as, as radical as it gets. <laughs> I can't think of any other bird that's that's so extreme in 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 all areas. You know, the foils, the aerodynamics, the structures, the systems, everything everything has to be taken to the to the highest level. You know, and you need. And you need the, the 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 best possible people in all in all areas to design this boat. So it's it's as radical as it gets for sure. So that's the four chief designers we'll be talking to throughout the rest of the podcast. We kicked the chat off with a few questions about everyone's thoughts on the four designs currently out sailing, and I first asked Team New Zealand's Dan Berners-Scone how surprised he was to see four very different design interpretations from his original set of design criteria. I'm thinking back to when we were sort of waiting with anticipation to see other people's yachts, other teams' yachts. I I guess we were expecting quite a lot of variation because the rule is quite open and um, there's plenty of scope to make different design choices. I mean, even within our own team, we had a lot of different ideas and in the end we had to pick pick a, a hull shape and go with it. Um, so not surprised that there is a lot of variation. Um, really glad that there is. It's, it's exciting. Uh, there's, I think, two main camps. Uh, the, there's more similarity between our yacht and Luna Ross's, and then more similarity between Ineos and American Magic. Um, so there's sort of two broad categories, but then uh, significant differences within all four. Can you give us an idea of your thoughts on what you've seen of the other three boats at all? Yeah, um, there's there's really interesting features in all the yachts. Um, in general, I think we, we've got a good understanding of why teams will have chosen to go down the paths they have. I mean, there's there's pros and cons in most aspects of design, and then it's a case of how you weigh up those trade-offs, uh, those pros and those cons, against what you think will be most important in a racing environment um, in 2021 or in the, the sort of summer of 2021 in Auckland. Um, so although I think all the teams will understand, you know, why why there are different hull shapes out there and, and re- you know, really different hull shapes, um, it, it comes down to how you evaluate the relative importance of the lower speed, the takeoff, the aerodynamics, um, high speed touchdowns and so on. I asked Luna Ross's Martin Fisher the same question. All the teams have now launched an AC-75. I mean, there's great footage online, you know, sailing fans hungry to, to see that. Of, I mean, there are four quite different designs even even to the untrained eye you can see that how surprised are you at the difference in interpretation from each of the four designs i'm i'm not so surprised actually i'm happy to see lots of differences because when we when we wrote down the rule um we we wrote or we tried to write an open rule that encourages uh diversity so um uh, we were it, it was no, it was not expected, but it was a desire to have uh, boats that really look different, and therefore the rule is written in a way such that there are different different solutions to the same problem, namely winning the cup. <laughs> so we, um, it is not uh, a straightforward path uh, where to go. So therefore, I'm not so surprised that um, that there are so different hulls, hull shapes. Um, but in the end, I think. Of course, they're different, but more or less, there are two types of hull shapes, and um, well, that's that's good to see that. Can you give us a, a, an idea of your thoughts on what you've seen on the 
on the other three boats? Yeah, the, <clears throat> I think we can split the four boats into two groups. There, there's American Magic and Ineos. They came up with, uh, very, with very flat hulls, so the, the bottom of the hull is, is really flat. And uh, it, to my understanding, they are looking for, for writing moment uh, in order to, get, to produce lots of power and then get quick onto the foils. Whereas Team New Zealand and us, um, we, uh, we went for a hull with a sort of hump at the bottom and uh, the, so obviously both of us we were less looking or less keen uh, to get lots of writing moment and uh, for us it was more important to reduce the wetted surface when the boat comes out of the water and so that's one aspect aspect and then the other aspect is uh, aerodynamics so um, uh, the the drag of these boats or the aerodynamic drag of these boats uh, represents about 50% of the total drag, so aerodynamics are extremely important. And uh, we think that with this hump, uh, the aerodynamics is slightly better because um, the hull actually creates a so-called end plate effect. So the, for the sail to work efficiently, uh, it is important to reduce as much the flow of air in between the hull and the, um, and the water surface. And with this extension of the hull, we close this gap and therefore we think that our sails work a little bit more efficiently and therefore create more thrust. So there are several aspects and... <laughs> there's lo lots of things to weigh up. I mean, I guess like all aspects of sailing, there's, there's a sort of risk and reward. I mean, what's, what's the risk, I guess, of... Of, of your thinking about having, you know, having that kind of hull? There, there are risks involved. I must say I don't want to go into detail <laughs> because uh, if, if I speak openly about that, I reveal or disclose some of the weak points that we see, um, which are, of course, then, as you say, in every design there is um, there's a trade-off between potential gains and potential risks. One risk, of course, that, uh, that we have with this kind of shape is that uh, these hulls have less writing moment than the flat bottom hulls. So um, in, in non-foiling conditions and also in, during the takeoff phase, we are lacking a bit of power at the beginning at least. So during the acceleration phase at the beginning, there's less, of, less power, but um, we think we can overcome that. Um, obviously, Ineos and uh, American Magic, they put more importance to that aspect than us. Um, well, the future will show who's right. I don't know at the moment. Before we then hear Team Ineos' thoughts on the comparisons, there's an important footnote to add. The teams have all been busy designing their AC75s according to the AC75 class rule, which was published on March the 29th, 2018. While this stated the rules governing the restrictions on boat design and build, what the teams did not know was the actual wind limits, upper and lower, that the Challenger Series and Cup match would be raced in. When designing foils for a 75-foot foiling monohull, this information was quite important. But at the time of interview for this podcast, this decision was going through mediation as determined by the America's Cup arbitration panel. The wind limits have actually since been set at a minimum across all competition of 6.5 knots and a maximum of 21 to 23 knots for elements of the Challenger series and the cup match respectively. However, on asking Nick Holroyd for his thoughts on the comparisons and differences between the hull shapes, it's important to note that he still did not know the exact wind limits. Back with Nick at Team Ineos UK. Nick, there's four quite different designs out there. How surprised are you at any difference in interpretation from each of the four design teams? Um, I'm not surprised at all, to be honest. Um, there is, and it, it's kind of levelling out, but there's a certain asymmetry in the America's Cup in terms of information. Um, so, Defender certainly challenge record, I think, uh, understood the class rule as it was going to be quite a long time before it was released to us. Um, 
So, so in some senses, I think if you look at uh, ourselves in American magic, you probably see um, perhaps some similar similarities there, um, and, and that that you know aspects of that uh, information asymmetry continue to this day. And I mean, there's you know, as Team New Zealand have recently put out a press release. I guess I can speak about it, but the the, the absence of mat match conditions at the appropriate time, um, and and while Team New Zealand focused on the upper wind limit and that uh, press release, actually the one that's interesting to us is the lower wind limit um, that we're racing on, it hugely drives the area we put into the foils in terms of getting foiling early, etc. So yeah, we obviously, you know, we've made our thoughts known to the arbitration panel on those. We'd like to see that resolved quickly because it does drive the design process. The fact that we're all in different corners right now, um, not surprising at all. Will we likely see things converge quite rapidly in the second generation? Yes. Um, and then ultimately, the question remains: Is you know, is this a hardware or a software race um, by the end of the end of the match? Can you give us an idea of your thoughts on what you've seen of the other three boats? Um, the Kiwi boat is you know, clearly very well thought out. Um, and, and quite a coherent design. Um, again, you know, in light of the discussion that's happening with the arbitration panel, is has focused quite heavily in the sort of light air, early takeoff corner. Um, ourselves in American Magic, I think, uh, were assuming actually lighter air again that we would have to run in displacement mode at some point. Um, and then the Italians um, have. Uh, kind of probably cut out, I think, that very light air corner altogether. So, um, so yeah, very different interpretations. Um, and yeah, I think we will see convergence in, uh, pretty quickly. When you're designing something which is so finessed, which is looking for, you know, the, the minutia of, of improvement, I mean, how tough is it not knowing where, you know, where the lim wind limits are, where the parameters are? Um, I mean, that's, that's a really big thing and, and, and it's driven, why it's such a big thing is because it's driven by lead times for the components. You know, the foils are complex, they take a long time to build. Um, it's probably no secret we're already building our, our boat too. Um, and, and so you are making decisions slightly in a vacuum, you know. Um, to some extent you look at the people who have the power in the situation, which is, is probably the defender first and foremost and you look at the type of uh, game you think they're going, they've designed their yacht for, and, and at this stage we probably have to operate on um, you know, looking at, you know, making assumptions on where they've gone and, and, and following down that path. We've seen two boats with a more shaped hull, yourselves and the Americans have a, have a much flatter hull. What's your thinking behind this choice? I think it's, as I just mentioned, it's um, in relation to whether you ever expected the hulls to perform in a displacement mode or not. Um, and uh, you know, as I say, ourselves and, and, and the Americans are probably operating from very similar information backgrounds and, and the other two are somewhere else. Perhaps, you know, just uh, explain to us the, the benefits of having a, a flatter hull when you're flying. Ultimately, we're talking about the voters of fuselage once we're flying, right? Um, so we we're interested at that point in in how the boat impacts the aerodynamic efficiency of the rig, um, how well it hides the crew from windage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, yeah, the if you if you look looking at the boat as a displacement boat, I think you end up in one corner. Um, if you're looking at the boat purely as a early takeoff launch vehicle, um, because you will only be racing in enough breeze to be in that. Uh, sector, then, then you end up with a dichotomy. We're back with Marcelino at American Magic. Marcelino, we've all seen the four designs out there right now. How surprised are you at any difference in interpretation from each of the four design teams? I'm not so surprised by the new concepts. You know, the, the, some are pretty different from ours, but it's not, it's not a big surprise what we've seen. What it, is, what it is a little bit more surprising is the level of development of some of the teams because uh, I guess our, our philosophy was to, or, or our, our idea was to, to get the boat 
the first blood in the water as soon as possible and not dedicate too much too much work to the details of that first boat. However, some of the boats that we've seen have, have a lot of detailing in, in, the, in the design, you know, and, and from that point of view, I mean, for us, it didn't work at the end because of the delays with the, with the, with the foil arms, but our, our idea was to get the boat as soon as possible and, and concentrate as, as, as soon as possible on, this, on the second boat. Can you comment at all on your thoughts regarding what you've seen of the other three boats? Yeah, well, it's, it's hard to comment at this early stage, you know, it's, uh, but it does seem that this, 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 uh, this uh, different, uh, especially with the hull ships, there's, there's different uh, philosophies, there's uh, Ineos and American Magic, which are similar in, in, in the hull shapes, uh, not so much on other details, but at least in the underwater a part of the of the hull ships, uh, the similar. The other two teams are a little bit uh, less stability, less form stability with the with the hull shapes. But uh, aerodynamically, also they're, they're quite different. Why has that happened? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, the, the teams have their own their own way to of, of of dealing with the problem. You know, I mean, that's it's hard to tell. <laughs> We've seen two boats with a more shaped hull. American Magic are running a much flatter hull shape. What are the design choices that result in this flat hull choice? Well, um, it provides a little bit more form stability for the for the for the for the hulls, and uh, when the boats are in in non-displacement mode. It's it's a good template for the aerodynamic efficiency of the of the platform. So those those were the main the main two uh, driving fact factors behind that 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 sort of boat. You really have to make some pretty difficult decisions about how you're going to weigh up the different areas of performance. You want to democratize the data. You don't want it held in the hands of analysts. So that's the team's thoughts on where things are heading to date. My next question was to Dan Bernasconi and relates to an area of design that has been widely credited as a vital part of New Zealand's win in Bermuda back in 2017. Dan, the teams all seem to have come out with a degree of foiling ability on their first builds. How much is that down to simulation use, do you think? I mean, the simulator you had during the build for the last cup, of course, heralded as one of the team's big strengths. How much simulation is going into these AC-75s? Well, the whole class was developed um, with uh, using just a simulator. So um, although the first sketches were on paper, it, it quickly uh, developed into simulator models of all the different concepts that we were evaluating for the AC-75 class, um, all sorts of different types of foiling and displacement boats. And I think without the simulator, we never would have had the confidence to go ahead with this pretty radical class of yacht without having built a prototype. Um, so, yeah, really important in the, the, the conceptual phase, but then just like in the last cup, and, and even more so, really, uh, the simulation is becoming uh, an ever more important part of design. Pretty much everything that we design in terms of um, performance aspects of the yacht, sails, in hull shapes, in foils, rudders, um, all goes through a simulation process. And I think what's really cool about that is it, it really connects the design team with the sailing team. So designers need sailors in order to sail the simulator and basically to, to tell them whether a design is fast or not because it, ultimately it comes down to a lap time. Uh, so the discussion and the conversation about what a better foil or what a better hull shape might be or what the trade-offs of, of those uh, things are uh, it is really enabled by the, the simulator. Um, and there's, there's such a good working relationship between sailors and designers when they sit down in the simulator room uh, for a, a, a few days coming up to, a, say, a full design deadline um, where we can really all learn together about the, the various characteristics of the falls we're looking at. 
Having set the design criteria, Dan, what do you see as the biggest challenge in designing a winning AC75? I think there's, there's a few things. I mean, first of all, it's a really complex boat um, and you've got to get around the track. Uh, there's a huge number of electronic and hydraulic components on the yacht uh, and some pretty complicated mechanical systems. So I think inevitably in, in the first World Series races in Cagliari, uh, I, I'd be very surprised if there aren't some races won or lost through um, mechanical breakdown. Um, but I think by the time we get to the Prada Cup and the America's Cup in Auckland um, in 2021, then uh, you know the, the, maybe there'll be a, the occasional issue. But um, touch wood, uh, the races will be decided mainly on performance. And then I, I think it's it's a really difficult question because it's such an interesting boat in terms of design trade-offs. Uh, you really have to make some pretty difficult decisions about how you're going to weigh up um, the different areas of performance, light wind speed, heavy, he sorry, light wind, heavy wind, um, upwind, downwind, uh, takeoff versus straight line versus maneuvers. Um, there is not one boat which will be best at all of those categories together. So um, there's some pretty difficult decisions to be made around how to balance those trade-offs, what you're going to focus on, uh, trying to get the best compromise. And, you know, ultimately there might be a bit of luck because if, if one team designs a boat for, for lighter breeze and the cup ends up being in lighter breeze, then they've got an advantage. Plenty of decisions to be made then. But one of the key elements in this design, of course, is that the AC75 is at some point going to shift from being in displacement mode a la traditional monohull to foiling mode and as this transition takes place it brings with it a host of new design decisions. A question I put to Luna Rossa's Martin Fisher. In the hope that the, the hulls will be flying much of the time, I mean how much more is the hull design influenced by aerodynamic rather than hydrodynamic decisions? It's, it's on par, it's equal. Um, the Aerodynamics of the hull is play an important role, of course, during <clears throat> during the takeoff phase or if you have a crash, if the boat drops and you have to restart again, then the hydrodynamics are very important. But uh, once you are foiling, obviously the hydrodynamics of the hull no longer count. There's no importance of that, and then it's only aerodynamics. So du during the development, we put as much emphasis on on aerodynamics as on hydrodynamics. We worked really full on on both aspects because we think they're equally important. Marcelino from American Magic. Can you compare for us the, the balance, the payoffs, if you like, between maximum aero or hydrodynamic efficiency? I mean, obviously the hulls are designed to fly above the water as much as possible. So which is more important to the design of American Magic? Well, we're, we're clearly not counting having to sell the boats in displacement mode a lot. So uh, the, the aerodynamics is much more important than the, than the hydro. That's, that's, that's pretty clear. Now, the, the hydro also is important, especially for the takeoffs. And, and, and if, you do, if you do do some uh, displacement sailing, obviously it's got some, some relevance. But we were talking about that uh, here in the office the other day. And, uh, and you know, it's one of those things that you wouldn't have imagined uh, not too many years ago. You know, a boat that can can sail at 40 knots and it's not even touching the water with the with the hulls. You know, that's something pretty amazing. I then put a similar question to Ineos's Nick Holroyd. How important has aerodynamics in design become in a world where hydrodynamics has obviously been king? I mean, it's, it's one half of our balance sheet, if you like, you know, it's the drive force half of the equation and, and you can't afford to, to ignore it for a second. Um, you know, aer sail aerodynamics are hard, you know, it's flying shapes, not really knowing uh, exact shapes, etc. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, it is roughly half of our total effort, actually. Um, it's, a, it's a huge part of, of a whole design thing. The boats, um, you know, will evolve, I think, to having 
ultimately when, when foiling very similar wetted surface areas, etc. cetera, um, how you, the subtleties of how you're using that wetted surface area uh, you know, will clearly evolve and pay dividends and, and bias certain boats uprange or downrange or you know, upwind, downwind, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, the sail plan is always there. And, and the second thing is the measurement protocols um, for this coming cup are somewhat different to, to the last two. So we've been used to being able to, um, to modify on a daily basis, you know, choose foils for up, you know, uprange or downrange or what have you. Uh, this time we are going to be obliged to do the measurement certificate five days prior to the cup. So it's about the limit of forecastable weather in Auckland. It moves, moves through there pretty quickly. Um, and then we have to keep that configuration through uh, the remainder of the cup. And so actually your, your moding tools become aerodynamic rather than hydrodynamic. Um, so you, you start to look at the sail plan, obviously, and, and how we could mode the boat against uh, opposition if we see them as being strong or weak in certain places. With that in mind, Nick, the team have recently announced a partnership with Formula One team Mercedes AMG Petronas. We often see announcements like this around the cup, but they have a huge design pedigree and obviously a massive knowledge base when it comes to aero design. What is this collaboration bringing to the design team here? I've been involved in sort of technical partnerships, I guess, across however many cups over 20 years. Uh, and this is head and shoulders uh, above anyth anything we've ever worked in. Um, so yes, they, uh, they have enormous resource. Um, we have roughly 15 embedded engineers um, in our process. We have access to specialties that we wouldn't normally have access to. So, you know, we, we break something and we can go to a metallurgist in their gearbox division and, and find out, you know. Um, so, so the kind of breadth that brings in is, is huge. Um, for me personally, working, um, you know, being able to sit there and, and watch guys like James Allison work um, and, and, and a kind of steering group mentoring uh, system they bring with them is, uh, is fascinating. Um, so look, it's uh, um, specifically areas they're working on, um, helping us with simulation, as you mentioned, helping us with, with aerodynamics. There is a, a pretty steep learning curve from their side in terms of kind of the domain specific knowledge about how we run our VPPs and, and kind of what the performance drivers are on the, in the marine side, because they are actually quite different to, um, to a car. So yeah, look, it's been, a, it's been an absolute pleasure um, to bring them in. Amazing organization, um, amazing organization culturally um, in terms of, to a man, the people we've had here the absence of ego and uh, stuff has been remarkable to work with. Obviously, data analysis is also a huge part of Formula One, but last time around, this team were running a pretty comprehensive remote data analysis system. The flight deck saw the team tracking data off the boat live while sailing. Can you give us a sense of how much data is being analysed and how important this part of the process is? It is, you know, we, we again, by rules and protocol, uh, prevented from doing any testing in kind of a closed environment. So wind tunnels, towing tanks, etc., are all, all off the menu for us. So we then, that forces your whole working paradigm into the computational domain. So lots of CFD and, and simulation work. And obviously we take design candidates, we run them through those tools, we go to the human in the loop simulator, we run them there. We take them out on the water, the guys uh, give us feedback, et cetera. Um, but the, yeah, essentially that analysis of, of what's happening on the water, what we're seeing there, are we achieving uh, what the tools tell us, is, is such a critical part of the loop because ultimately you're reliant on those tools to drive the next loop of, of, of design innovation and iteration, right? And so um, if those there's two things you need from those tools. One is kind of fidelity. They've got to give you the right answer, otherwise they start you know, pushing you in, in wrong directions. Uh, and the second thing, and that's been something we've worked really hard on this time around, is they've got to be productive. You've got to be able to kind of work through and crank the handle and do those design iterations really carefully. 
Um, in terms of the data feeds and what have you, to be fair, I probably have more situational awareness of what's happening on the boat, sitting at my desk, watching all the camera feeds uh, and listening to the comms on board the boat. I can hear the tone of Ben's voice, whether he's pissed with something or, or otherwise. Um, and yet I can still get a day, day's work done and, and drive the process. So, so yeah, that, those are hugely enabling technologies. Um, and, and it means, you know, exactly, I can, I can sit here. Uh, you know, obviously we're building, building boats and foils and what have you, and, and that's driven from, from here in Canberra. The boat's down in Cagliari, and, and I can join a, a debrief meeting at four o'clock this afternoon and, and contribute to that in some meaningful way. Uh, the last cup, obviously, you know, the, the information all came to, to a rib and, and the rib chased the boat around at, at 40 knots around the great sound of, of Bermuda. Perhaps just, just explain, you know, the, the advancement in the process now and, and simply how it works. Um, I mean, it's the, it is the same thing, essentially. Um, you know, we, we have the, all the boats out there on a mesh network that, uh, so they can all, sh all see data in, in very live time. Um, you know, that structural engineers need that in, you know, obviously real time to be monitoring alarms and, and understanding what's happening on board from a safety aspect. Uh, and then once it's on that mesh network, um, yeah, it's essentially across uh, 4G uh, networks or 5G networks back to back to the main infrastructure and, and back here. Um, then once it's in here, um, you know, one, again, one of the tools we started really early and, and have built up is um, you want to democratize the data. You, you, want, you don't want it held in the hands of analysts specifically. You want to, that anyone can come in, open a web browser, click on a day's, a link for a day's sailing, choose what channels of information they're particularly interested in, which video views and what have you, and, and be presented with this kind of time-synced uh, dashboard of, of what's happening out there in a, in a, in a really sort of seamless way. That, um, and then you want to be able to communicate that around the team. So I see something interesting that I want to communicate to the foil guys. I, I want to just be able to go, you know, here, here's a web link, click on this and, and tell me what you think. So all of those aspects of, of how you run the data, how you make it accessible, um, and ultimately how you use it to drive uh, the sort of integrity of the design process uh, are key. Throughout various filming sorties in the build-up to the last cup in 2017, I spent a lot of time out on the water with several of the teams, much of that time in ribs full of design team members, away from their desks, on station to oversee data gathering, answer questions and help fix any issues. So I put it to Dan Berners-Cone that the now widespread use of real-time live data analysis, which Team New Zealand are also running in Auckland, must be a huge step forward in design team efficiency. Yeah, what the big change is for this campaign is being able to stream the video and data live back to all the guys on the shore. So, um, I mean, it's a long day on the water. Like yesterday we were out on the water for about nine hours. And so if you're a designer interested in what's happening for maybe one hour of testing within that nine hour period, um, in the last campaign you'd have been out on the water for the whole day. And it's, I mean, it, it's, it's crucial that you're there, but it's, it's pretty inefficient in terms of getting a day's work done. Um, so with 5G, we were able to stream all that data and video live back to the guys on the shore and so they can just switch on and tune in for the the bit of testing that's relevant to, to their area of design and in terms of what we're analyzing live i think i mean we're trying to get more and more um live data analysis we traditionally we would always have debriefs and you you go sailing and then you come in from a day sailing and you the sailing team sit with the design team and go through the, the data. Um, but I think the more immediate feedback you can give, the more valuable it is. So um, it, it's valuable if you can say to them several hours later, oh, remember that tack there, this is what happened. Whereas if you can give that feedback sort of straight whilst the tack's happening or straight after the tack, it's, it's a lot more useful and I think it accelerates the learning curve a lot.
And then regarding the class rule itself, we've not seen monohulls in the Cup since 2007. So there's been a huge amount of development in multi-hulls in the last decade. And then, of course, massive steps in foiling and all that that's brought with it. How transferable then is what you've learned up to 2017 in what you're designing now? Yeah, traditionally in, in the America's Cup, a, a team that has won and gone on to defend that cup has usually chosen a class which is very similar to the, the previous class because they, they believe that they're the team which is strongest in that type of boat and they've got the, the best design ideas for that type of boat. I think what we believed as a team um, was that our strength was in innovation and in using simulation. So being able to uh, design a yacht to meet a new set of rules um, and a new concept. So although the yacht itself is quite different, pretty much all of the technology we use to design that yacht um, in terms of hydrodynamics, aerodynamics, um, foil design, structural design, materials, particularly the composite, carbon composite materials, um, all the solid modeling technology and the, the simulator uh, is all very, very transferable. So uh, although the yacht looks completely different, um, it's very much the same bunch of people uh, designing the yacht and I wouldn't want anybody else uh, f from the guys we've got um, because the, the experience we have in the design team is, is absolutely phenomenal and I think uh, what they excel at is, is applying their experience and creativity to uh, an, a different type of uh, design problem. Looking into the variation in hull design that's prevalent across the four AC75s, one concept that comes to the fore has to be that of end plating. It's a key efficiency driver in the design of the areas around the hull. So I put it to our designers to explain the concept and to explain just how end plating will manifest itself in the designs we've already seen. First up, Luna Rossa's Martin Fisher. If if a wing creates a, a lift or a sail, a side force, then you have on one side you have high pressure and on the other side, on the leeward side, you have low pressure. And obviously air wants to flow from high pressure to low pressure. And at the top and at the bottom, there's nothing that prevents the air to flow from, from the high pressure side, so from the windward side to the low, pr uh, low pressure side on the leeward side. And this flow of air represents a big loss in efficiency. So if you do nothing, so if you leave a big gap at the bottom of the sail, then roughly the first two, three meters of a big sail, maybe even more, uh, basically create no force and no thrust. They just produce drag. And if you close that gap, so if you make sure that the air cannot flow from the high pressure side to the low pressure side, then also this lower part of the sail works very efficiently and you gain a lot in terms of uh, force produced by, produced by the sail and um, obviously thrust, so forward force, that uh, accelerates the boat. And the second aspect is that if the lower part works efficiently, then the center of effort is further down and so for the same healing moment of the boat, you can create more, even more sail force and you gain even more. So there are two aspects uh, why this is so important. One is the efficiency of the sail and the other one is that the center of effort of the sail comes further down. When we talk about the, the hull designs, you also talk about end plating. So perhaps, you know, give us a, just explain to us, I guess, the, the thoughts about the end plating with the hull. Mm -hmm. the, at the bottom of the, or underneath the, the sail, there sits the hull, and all the teams have a, a sail that goes all the way down to the, to the deck. Uh, but then, so there, there's no airflow between the sail and the deck but the air can still flow around the hull, underneath the hull, and then to the other side. And again, destroy the, the, the efficiency of, not destroy, but uh, reduce the efficiency of the mainsail. 
and by sailing very low, such that the gap between the water surface and the hull becomes as small as possible, we can reduce this, uh, this through flow uh, to, a, to a minimum and therefore improve the end plate effect. And uh, with, well, with our hump at the bottom, we close this gap even further and therefore um, minimize the through flow and maximize the end plate effect. I then asked Nick Holroyd just why end plating is such an important concept. If you achieve perfect end plating, um, uh, we talk about the effective span of the rig. So if I took the rig half a mile into the air and, and the rig's 25 metres high, give or take a, a little bit, um, then it would look like a 25 metre wing. Um, if I could you know, effectively set that rig up one millimetre off the water surface and treat the water surface as a perfect end plate, in a, in a mathematical sense what you would see is more or less a reflection of the rig under the water. And so we have this 25 metre rig on the air side, if you like, and, and a reflection of it below the water. And so now aerodynamically, I'm seeing, seeing a rig that has twice the span. And if we think aerodynamically of uh, aircraft that try to be super, super efficient, we see really high span. So if we go to a competition glider or something like that, we see this enormous, enormous wingspan. So the end plating is, is a way that we can uh, increase the span of the rig, artificially if you like, um, and, and make it more efficient. So that's why we're, we're all playing with it. For the sailing fan, you know, watching, watching the, the bits of video we get a, a, of the boats, I mean, what, what would we see, which, what effects would we see? What would have been done to the boat to encourage um, end plating? Well, you, you will see for sure, I think, um, and, and you know, we've been doing this forever and a day with jibs, right? You, you, you never leave a, a gap between the bottom of your jib and the foredeck. Um, okay, so the foredeck in that case is the end plate for the jib. Here we're probably going um, a step further in that we see, I think we'll see the, um, the complete rig end plated to the boat, so seal on both jib and mainsail. Um, so now you've, you've effectively connected the the lifting surfaces, the ones with camber, etc., you know, the sails, down to the hull. Okay, well, I've got that in part of the end plate going. And then, um, and then you're looking at how, um, how do people, what, what are people doing to the design of the boat to try and, and get a connection from the boat to the, to the water surface. And, and I think we're seeing some quite different solutions out there. With a, a flatter hull, which you have, how important is end plating the underside of the hull as well as the top side? In all cases it's important. Um, if the hull as an end plate is bigger, more effective, then the gain from further end plating it to the water will be smaller or less effective. And I think that's probably the difference you see across the fleet to some degree. Talking about the, the concept of end plating, Marcelino, with American Magic's flatter hull design, how important is the end plating of the underside of the hull? And how would you be looking to achieve this? Well, it's, it's clearly important, and, uh, but there's many ways to achieve this, you know, and uh, unfortunately, it's, I mean, it's not one of those things that I can really comment too much on about. Maybe if you do this interview in a few months, I could give you more details, but uh, it is something that we we, we look at uh, pretty closely, you know, how to how to end plate the the whole the whole uh, aero uh, package and, and and make it more efficient. That's that's clearly uh, uh, one of the main objectives of, of the of the design of the hull surface. Yeah. Just explain to us why it is so important, and I guess what what the payoffs are. What's the the risk and rewards of it all? Well, it's, it's it's important because because you get a more a more efficient uh, for more efficient sailplane and therefore more driving force with less drag. You know, so that's why it's efficient. You know, you get a faster boat, and uh, basically that's that's the that's that's what you're trying to achieve with a more efficient uh, aerodynamic package. You know? We're used to talking about in plating, you know, ab above the deck, in, you know, in terms of of the sail plan, but not necessarily so much underneath. 
how much relevance is it there and, and how difficult has it been to design f for that? Well, on a, on a conventional boat, the, the, the water surface is your end plate. So obviously you, you try to, to, um, to close the gap between the sail and the, and the, and the deck because you already have a, an end plate below that. So you need, don't need to work on, on that as a, as an end plate on, on this boat, it's obviously the flying above the water. So, so, so there's a gap between underneath the boat, which, which, uh, which obviously, um, uh, you would, you would like to close if possible. What are the other key factors that have led you to the specific hull shape that you've come up with in boat one? As I said before, you know, our, 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 um, our thinking was, uh, originally that, uh, we wanted a boat that that uh, that could perform uh, well, but the idea originally was to to have a boat that was simple, easy to sail for the for the crew, reliable, and that would be a good a good learning curve. The the, the performance was not such a big driver because uh, obviously we gave ourselves very little time to to come up with this boat, and. Yeah, as I say, the main objective was was as a as a good learning platform. That was that was really what what uh, we really wanted to achieve. Obviously, with the second boat, uh, it's a different story. We performance is going to be everything. So uh, we it's, it's the, the the time we dedicated to that to that design was uh, was much more. Um, uh, geared to to performance than with with the first boat. So that is where we're going to wrap up the first edition of our AC design discussion. I hope you agree it's been an absolutely fascinating glimpse into the very secretive world of America's Cup design. Part two of the discussion, which we'll be posting online in a day or so, will dig a lot deeper as we discuss the nuances of foil design, the differences in each team's current setup sail design, the rules regarding power generation, and what our four designers think we'll see as each team launches their second AC75 cut boat. It's a fascinating listen. I cannot go without saying a massive thank you to all four of our designers. Thank you so much to each of you for all of your time in doing this podcast. It's massively appreciated. But thank you also to everyone that helped make the remote interviews happen. To Hamish Hooper in Auckland, a big, big thank you, Hamish, you're a legend. And to Will Ricketson at American Magic for helping do the interview with Marcelina for us. And of course, a bigger than normal thanks to the ever diligent Tim at Vertical Films for taking on the massive workload of this four person podcast, putting it all together and making it all make sense. You're a star. That's it for this pod, but do tune in to part two. It's another fascinating discussion of some of the real intricacies of the AC75. If you'll be watching the racing unfold throughout the coming months, it's a compelling and unmissable listen. Thanks again for listening. Sail safe, everyone. One race of speaking. After coming here, the race is coming. We're 1.5 below. Stand by, two dives here, boys. We're looking at 10.5 to 42. This is Castle One standing by. Out.